27-year-old Terrence Woods of Maryland was reported missing. He was filming in the Orgrand area and got separated from his film crew up in northern Idaho. In addition to Idaho County personnel, the Forest Service, the U.S. Air Force, and backcountry rescue helicopters are assisting in the search efforts as we speak. A TV producer working on a hit show near a deserted mine vanishes. Never to be seen again. There are many words you can use when someone is missing. But which one accurately describes what happened to Terrence Woods? His former colleagues claim they saw him run down a steep cliff that led to a forest. Broadcast media professional and University of Maryland alum Terrence Woods Jr. missing since October 5th, 2018 after a shoot at the Penman Mine in Idaho. And at the time since, there have been more questions than answers. The story seems very bizarre. Uh, it's just unbelievable. If Terrence was there with the crew at the time, they would have found some sort of DNA or clothing, footprints, evidence of him being there. But for a crew who are trained to be in conditions like this to find absolutely nothing of him is very bizarre. But I gotta keep going. I wanna find the truth out. This is a story that should have wall-to-wall -wall coverage, but as with most missing persons cases in the United States, some get coverage, but most do not. Today, it all changes. Join us as five years on, we simply ask, where is Terrence Woods? The broadcast industry, as anyone in it will tell you, is a small world. And if you're good at what you do, and you have a good attitude to boot, you tend to be rewarded with massive opportunities. And boy, did Terrence earn them. He was an integral part of many productions, not just during his time at the Philip Merrill College of Journalism, the award-winning Viewfinder and Capital News Surface being just two of many examples. But after he graduated, it's certainly fair to say that in the UK, he was a big fish in a small pond given all this work, be it independent films, documentaries, or big network reality competitions. And we're only just scratching the surface. But back stateside, Terrence was on a shoot at the Penman Mine in Idaho for a spin-off of the Discovery Channel show Gold Rush, Dave Turns Lost Mine. The UK-based production company Raw, who Terrence worked with, produces that show. But on October 5th, the day that he disappeared, this happened. Production had traveled from Montana to Idaho. Then I received a text saying that he was coming home early. And that was the last text or anything. I don't know if it came from him or not. It has also been reported by the show's associate producer, Simon G, that Terrence ran down the cliff very fast, suddenly, and disappeared into the forest. But given the terrain, is that a possibility? After all, the crew came back with clothes covered in blood, but what about Terrence's? Is Raw TV telling the truth about the circumstances surrounding his disappearance, especially on the day that he disappeared? What is the true status of the investigation into Terrence's case? We reached out to Raw TV at the Idaho County Sheriff's Office. We'll have more about that later, but first, Mahul Ajaria and Dion Mitchell, the hosts of the Crime Redefined podcast, join us. Mahul and Dion's four decades of combined experience in media and criminal justice make them perfect for this conversation, as we examine in broad strokes much of the facts and theories surrounding the case and much more, including how we can keep stories like Terrence's in the forefront and the one thing that could very well break this case wide open. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. It is great to have the both of you on. And let's go ahead and get started here, okay? You, so, absolutely, it is great to have you guys on. We've definitely wanted to have you guys on for quite a bit ever since we started to, on our show, discuss the case of Terrence Woods. And by the time we air this, it will have been five years yeah. since Incredible. Terrence yeah. has been missing. Yeah, and it is uh, stuff that seems to have... I, I guess it's fair to say more questions than answers. Um, the podcast that you guys did, uh, the two-parter you guys did on uh, Terrence and his case where you guys interviewed uh, his father, Terrence Sr., was absolutely incredible. Really well done. Uh, we'll have a link for our viewers in the description below. And I'll, you know, we'll definitely get to talking about that work in a second. But first... How did you guys become interested in covering uh, the case? And I'll let you guys go ahead and jump in on this. 
Sure. It actually all started with a Hollywood trade paper. So I got a digital print of a, like I said, a trade paper and uh, the article had Terrence's face on there and he was just like looking at me. And uh, so I went down, read the article and then read that it was a disappearance on set. And having spent most of my adult life on sets, I thought, okay, something's not right here. So already it had piqued my interest on, on that point. And then I started kind of like, you know, banging Mayhole's door saying, hey, listen, we, we, we got to get involved with this, you know, between our experience on set, you know, and his background in investigations and working, you know, as a forensic examiner said, hey, listen, we need to do a deep dive in here and find out what's really going on. People just don't walk off sets. Yeah. And, and I have to say, you know, like Dan said, I did drag my feet at first. I was like, yeah, 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 I'll get to that. But then when I popped open the news coverage, it was like, wait a minute, this is a major Hollywood story that has very little coverage. And I, I immediately searched to see if there are any updates and there was nothing. And, and I couldn't believe it. And I just thought, yeah, let's let's put on our investigative hat here. Let's get as close to the source as possible, which would be Terrence Woods Sr. And let's just see, you know, can we help get some information out there, put a spotlight on it? And so I told Dion, I'm all in. Let's go for it. And then uh, yeah. one quick follow up, Eugene. Part of that is that we bring kind of a unique pairing to this. Like I said, you know, his background and mine. And then I'm actually familiar with this area as well. And so it's really, really remote in the middle of nowhere. And you just don't walk off a set. Yeah, I mean, when I started to look into this more, and to your point that even I was looking at, you know, Google Maps, you know, Google Earth, that, that terrain right there, it seems like you will need like a four by four to even get through some Just of, about. Yeah. you know, that stuff. So, and, and as you said, nobody really just runs off on film sets like that. Like, if it was any of my crew, that were to just run off. And, and, and it gets to this. There was all these reports saying that Terrence ran off, you know, like a hare. Right. And, I, and I just want to get, you know, your thoughts, Dion, since you're familiar with the area. Would there be any veracity to that claim, you know, that, that somebody would just run off like that? Okay, you know, let me give terrain? you that two kind of in two parts. Yeah, obviously, I have not physically been to the area. And I don't know Terrence personally. I wasn't on the set with that happened. But you're talking, this is over 3,000 feet, right? It's still cold that time of year there. He wasn't prepared for the outdoors. And this is a mine. This this hillside is is potmarked with with mine shafts, holes, mine, air ducts. Yeah. And it's, it's uh, I think even in my early 20s, in my best shape, I don't know if I could have trucked down this hillside and not after like six or seven steps falling on my face. Well, I yeah. would add to that what, you know, what Terrence Sr. said, he's like, well, you know, my son was flat footed. He had special inserts in his shoes. And he said, I don't think this is accurate, but he said, you know, he weighs 97 pounds, meaning he's not like a big mountain man kind of guy who would be able to take this on. And then she, also, Eugene, this is this this hillside is shale rock. So it's it's almost impossible to run on. Um, it's it's just, you know, I don't know if you know what shale rock is, but it's flat rocks on top of flat rock. So. It's, you know, you have to, you know, walk really slow and really carefully because if not, you're just going to skid and land on your rear end all the way down the hill. Yeah, I mean, I, I always found that part of the story, you know, as it's been told anyway, as kind of sort of odd that, you know, you just, you know, run down like that. And this, especially what, what you've said about Shale Rock, it definitely would not make sense that that would be the case. So that is... You know that is definitely something right there. And go well, back to go 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 ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. We're... I would just just to build off that. <clears throat> furthermore, they didn't develop any evidence that he did go down that hill. You know, in that they did all of the searching. They did the helicopters. They did the dogs. They did the scent dogs. They didn't come up with any trace of him. Now there was some discussion that there was a trail that maybe ended at the road at the bottom of the cliff. Implication being that somebody picked him up in a car or something yeah. like that. But, you know, this is dog scent evidence. This is not DNA. You know, we don't know the how good the trainer was. We don't know how good the dog was. This is just sort of conjecture. This isn't something that's been vetted in a court of law. So, I mean, I think despite the most sensitive types of testing and investigation, they didn't turn up a trace of Mr. And Woods. then two quick follow-ups yeah, on that, Eugene. Yeah. Well, one is the distance from 
the the location of where they were shooting the trailer to this road where they picked up the scent, you would have you would have had to been, uh, you know, a, a 10 100 sprinter to get to that distance in the distance. He said also, if my memory serves me correct, there is a uh, retired ATF that lived on the apex of that hill. And he said nothing gets by him coming or going because the road runs right past his cabin. I think he has dogs as well, a, a shepherd, and they would bark. So if any car had come past him, he would have heard it or seen it. And he said no. Well, the other yeah. narrative evidence we have is that supposedly other people in the crew tried to go after him. And when they came back, their clothes were all ripped up and they were bloody. So how is it that Terrence could successfully navigate that when nobody else could get through there without getting all tore up? And, and being completely unfamiliar with the area. Yeah. Yeah. And to that point, especially with the clothes, there was, and I'm kind of going a little bit ahead here, but like the suitcase that was brought back had all clean clothes, even unopened clothes, from my understanding of this. You know, it's like, where would the dirty clothes would have been? Right. And even on the side, there would have been, you know, some sort of trace of that. What did the what did there have been? Well, I think you know, uh, Terrence Senior said that there was one pair of muddy boots in that suitcase, which is very odd. And I just, I just think a trace evidence. I mean, I think there's a treasure trove of potential physical evidence in that suitcase. I know that Terrence Senior didn't want to open it for months, you know, obviously because he was under emotional trauma. But I'm just thinking, has anybody like went through the pockets of the clothing? Has anybody looked in the liner of the suitcase? Has anybody analyzed the dirt on the boots to see if it's even consistent with the area? Uh, I, there's just a treasure trove there, I think. And let me go to the clothes and not there's nothing there. As you know, Eugene, with your crew there, and like I said, I've spent a lot of time on sets, <laughs> you have a lot of dirty clothes. And after you wear them one day, they are so bad, you just throw them in the corner and then you just put them in a garbage bag and you take them home. So because you're just in them all day, you know, you're sweating in them, you're getting dirty. It's not like you're going to wear them. You're not going to put dirty clothes into a uh, into a suitcase. I don't I don't think there was a laundry mat there for him to wash them and put them back in his suitcase. Who washes clothes to take back home? So it just none of it really makes sense. And the more that we kept digging into this, the more that just, you know, the ends weren't connecting. Yeah, I mean, there is a lot of stuff that did not add up. There was also this one thing that I was looking at that apparently he was at a restaurant or something like of that nature, met somebody, exchanged information or whatever. Is that even remotely a possibility? Because I'm like, where would this other person be at all of this? And then the phone was not, um, also I'm getting to the phone, was not pinged. Now, I know that cell service may or not may or may not be a thing over there, um, or at least maybe just one bar. But what do you guys think of that? What, well, let's, what... let's go back. I mean, we tested this. We also, in addition to talking to Terrence Sr., we talked to Rochelle Newman, which is, which is a friend of Terrence Jr. in UK. Mm -hmm. And we, we, we proposed a story to her, and we basically said, does Terrence have this kind of game? You know, that he's going to be hitting on women at a restaurant. She thought it was completely out of his character to even do that. So if he did, I mean, this is a huge clue. Why aren't investigators going to the restaurant, figuring out it, who saw this? Or who the might have been? This, this is exactly. huge evidence. Where is that? I, I, I mean, Dion, you know, what, what, what do you say here? Well, I'm going to actually toss it back to Mayo because we, we actually tried to FOIA that information. Go ahead, Mel. Well, just in general, about a year ago, I went ahead and put in a FOIA request because Terrence Sr. said that he talked to the FBI and they gave him multiple case numbers about this. Um, so I hit him on FOIA and basically they stonewalled me. They said, well, we don't give information on missing persons cases um, because you're a third party. We wouldn't release it to you. And there's other regulations that we, we can't tell you any which way. So I got nowhere there. I emailed the Idaho County Sheriff's Office and asked them for public records. And they're still sticking to this story that it's an open investigation. That was well, the killer, I mean, Eugene. That was it right there. Because they're trying to hide behind that open investigation thing to so they wouldn't have to give up the surveillance. But it's yeah, not active. Uh, you know, they're not doing anything as far as we can tell. Yeah, there was a whole thing about that. And I was also watching the Dr. Phil 
uh, episode uh, that, that was done and where there's the question of whether this is open, whether this is closed. And it's like, yeah, they're saying it is open, but then they're not doing anything. This did not make any sense to me. This was very, very odd. And with the FOIA stuff, I mean, we're journalists. Yeah. We're journalists. Right. And, you know, we should be getting this information. And the fact that, you know, you know, people like you guys, you know, and even those of us who have been looking at this that are not getting the information, I think it's I, I think it's a pity. You know, it really, really is. Um so I, I want to go back. Uh, just a little bit, and um, you know, but who I, I want to go to you here um, yeah. about this particular aspect is that the laptop. You know, there was in listening to the podcast and looking at this, the laptop. And correct me if I'm wrong, but apparently there was some sort of firewall that was put in, or something of that nature, where you know it could not be accessed or whatever. And given your background in forensics that sort of thing, could that be something that could kind of sort of break this case open if we were to oh. find some information in there? You know, the funny thing is we probably now have the physical evidence to solve the case because Terrence yeah. Sr. has the laptop, he's got Terrence Jr.'s camera, and he's got the suitcase. And he's got the phone. Digital, he doesn't have the phone, but we That's could right. get the phone records. Um, so obviously digital evidence is huge these days. And so what Terrence relayed to us is that the sheriff's department said, oh, there's some kind of firewall on the laptop and almost like it's going to self-destruct if we try to get in there. Well, they obviously don't have the right expertise to do this type of work. Um, I work with a forensics, a digital forensics expert in Los Angeles. I talked to him about this. He actually wrote up a plan of 15 things that he would do with this laptop if he had it. So I think part of the problem is that the Idaho County Sheriff's Office, they don't do big investigations, right? It's a remote area. This doesn't cross their, their path very often. So I don't know that they have the right experts. But in telling senior that nothing can be done, that's nonsense. A, a good digital forensics expert will get in there and they'll get that information. Same goes for the camera. Because senior related that when he looked at the pictures that it seemed like they were out of sequence. Like there had been moving around of the information. Yeah, I think there was some stuff. Yeah, I, I think some uh, pictures of like, uh, you know, if I'm, you know, if I'm looking at my notes here, there were some pictures of another venue before or I think after the right. uh, stuff in Idaho. Right. That's I right. Because it should have should have been, OK, Montana and then right. Idaho. And then there was sort of something in between. But well, obviously, again, there's a lot of metadata in these camera files that can be downloaded and looked at. Um, another thing back to the laptop is you know, there's a big issue about Terrence's state of mind here, right? There's one narrative that he had an anxiety attack, something like that. Well, obviously mm -hmm. looking at his social media, looking at his laptop, in addition to locating, could give you some insight on what his mental state mental, yeah. really was. Um, think about what else could be on the laptop, his bank accounts, his password might be right there. That's huge mm -hmm. to know if there was money moved around. So I mean, that is stop number one in, in a real investigation. And so for the Idaho County Sheriff's Department to pretty quickly say, ah, there's no foul play here. Well, how the hell would they know? They didn't do an investigation. As far as we know, they talked to one crew member from Raw and they made their judgment based on that. Yeah. And there were supposed to be another, you know, 11 or 12 members of right. that crew that was to be in Idaho when Terrence Sr. was there. But there was only the one crew member, which struck me as, as odd. I mean, yeah, that's another kind of a little bit of a, you know, I don't want to start going down any conspiracy rabbit holes, but it seemed like the showrunner was in a big hurry to get his crew out of town so he can control all the conversation. Everything ran through him, um, but he was really eager to get his his whole team out of there really really fast and so that's uh that that's really curious and i also one thing on the laptop is that i think terrence senior might have misstated it's i don't think they're talking about a firewall i just think it was password encoded so mm -hmm. a firewall would be behind the pass it wouldn't be in front of it so right. i just think that you just need a you know a forensic expert to go in there and crack it and and get through the get through the passcode and then i think you'd have a like mahal said a, a treasure trove of information there as well as being able to digitally look at the metadata on all the photographs in the camera. 
And even the hard drive, you know, as well, I think would certainly be um, a part of that. So the question, I, because I was going to say, the question is, is that how do, you know, we get, you know, those kind of resources? Because as, you know, you said, the whole, it seems that, you know, the Idaho County Sheriff's Office, they don't really do big investigations. They don't have the kind of resources that, you know, maybe a big city. I mean, I'm here, you know, in, you know, near our nation's capital, you know, that sort of thing. It's like, the question is, how, you know, because that's the other stuff that I was also thinking about as well, is that uh, Terrence Senior, he's out private investigators. He was kind of burned uh, yes, by them. Yes, With, Yeah, without a doubt. Yeah. Uh, money, that sort of thing. Um, you know, Dion, explain that part of that. You know, to our to our viewers. You know, in so far as you know, these private investigators, and you know, he really got a raw deal out of them. Oh, I think without a doubt. After we, it actually broke our heart when we were listening to him kind of detail what he went through. There was no one around him to help him vet somebody. It was almost like he was just throwing a dart at a dartboard or picking somebody out of a phone book or, you know, reading a couple of reviews. And it sounds like the guy really took him for a ride. He didn't do, uh, you know, we, you know, Mejo as a team, we have a lot of guys we work with that are experts in this. And we kind of, you know, showed them what, you know, let them listen to the interview with Terrence. And they just said, yeah, this was guy was kind of a, a shyster from the, the get go, but he didn't really do anything and just kept, you know, trying to, uh, you know, keep uh, Terrence Senior to keep writing checks. And I really, it was really uh, sad to listen to. Yeah, no, it is because uh, you know, uh, of course. I mean, I'm not a parent, but you know, you can imagine. You know, if your child's missing and you want to get answers, you know, and all, you'll probably go to you know maybe the first person that says, right. "Okay, you know, we we can do something." We right, you know that right. sort of thing. Um, you know, uh, but hold, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think that Terrence has heard that a lot. People emailing him saying, "I hey, I can do this, I can do right. that. And there's no follow-up. And I'll tell you that, and he says flat out in his podcast with us, he was very hesitant to work with us just based yeah. on his past experience. But he knows that he needs to get the word out there. So um, yeah, this is part of the problem that he's gun shy. But I mean, to go to your big question, Eugene, and maybe I'll throw this to Dion. I mean, we have a plan to do an investigation here. Yeah, we did. We actually put together a PowerPoint presentations for Terrence Sr. And we outlined everything that had been done and then what wasn't done and then what we are going to do. And we actually want to put a team in the field, but we want him involved. And I, and I think because of his experience with, you know, whoever, investigators or whatever, he's still a little, uh, you know, a little gun shy about uh, working with us. But you're not going to know answers until you put a legitimate team in the field. And then I think you start to get answers really quick. If you can go there and you've got cameras and you're saying, you mean to tell me he ran down this, you know, you know, or or he, you know, walked out of the road here. Um, I think one of the people that they interviewed was the local uh, locations person, Valerie. She was the last one to see him that said he ran Shree, down the hill. Shree, th yeah, that's yeah. right. Uh, Shree um, said that, you know, he ran down the hill and but put his radio down, talk to her again, actually – you know, bring her up to the, the location, you know, stand next to her, stand next to where Terrence was, look down there, see if this is even, even plausible. Well, also Cherie was sort of the key witness to say, boy, I was talking to Terrence and he was telling me about he's having problems with his family and this and that. And she's kind of the primary voice in this, but we don't have, um, we don't have a lot of interviews with people who were close to Terrence to counter that, say that, that's not the case. Now, Terrence Senior described the life that he had with his son. And there was, yeah. yeah, it was wonderful. So we need a counterbalance to that testimony. The other question is, is I would want to re-interview Cherie and say, is that really how she right. conveyed it? Or is she just sort of speculating? You know, so let's get a real law enforcement type interview. Like, in other words, what would you testify to in a court of law? And let's get that down. Because a lot of this is just very hearsay and bits and pieces. Um, the whole problem here, Eugene, is that they didn't look at this as a foul play case from the beginning. And if you look at it as a foul play case, you're going to use the highest standards of investigation, which is what you need to do. Now, you can pull back from that and say, look, we went all in and, and investigated, and we're going to call it missing persons. But the best we can tell, they did a cursory investigation and said, we're going to call this missing persons. And then, you know, the standards go way down. Uh, like the FBI said, they don't get involved in that. Um, it's not as a, much of a big ticket. 
Plus, there's this narrative out here that, oh, maybe he just lost his mind, you know, and then we don't know what we can do. So it's just, it's a mess. It needs to be unraveled. It does need to be unraveled. And, you know, going to that, it's like there was a whole thing about him grabbing a, a drone out of the sky, which makes no right. sense, absolutely no sense. Um, but what I think is great is that you guys are going to be really doing an uh, investigation um, into this case. And, of course, um, if there's any way that we, as our team here at Common Sense Entertainment, can be involved, uh, in this, because I personally, I have even said on one of our shows that I would definitely would like to go to Idaho and really look at this site, you know, for myself and, and see what, you know, is going on. Because I think seeing definitely is, you know, believing and really being able to connect the dots and a lot of this. As far as in thinking about, to your point about, you know, the kind of, you know, with the FBI and, you know, the big ticket, you know, stuff, that, that sort of thing. Behold. Um, it kind of leads to going back to the lack of the coverage Yeah. in, in terms of this case. Because I think that this was a very big story. I think this deserves to be told. And I know that, Dion, you said at the beginning of the podcast that the more this story is told, the, the more people are going to come forward you know, in terms of, you know, discussing, uh, you know, this stuff right here. So what is the role of the media? What should the role be of the media in terms of covering these cases? And especially, I would say, also in covering missing minorities. Because, you know, again, when we look at some of the other cases, especially, you know, Gabby Petito yes, and some of yes. the others, wall-to-wall -wall coverage, yeah. John Walsh was involved uh, in this. He was everywhere, you know, of America's Most Wanted. Dog the Bounty Hunter was even involved in this stuff. But we don't see that kind of stuff for Terrence, you know, or, you know, so, you know, others. So what what do you guys say here? It, it, uh, it's frustrating of... because, because even if you, let's say you take color out of it for a second, this is a Hollywood case. This is a Hollywood producer from the UK that walked off a set. This is something that does not happen. So you think all the ingredients would be there for mass media, but they it's, it's like they did a flyby and that was it. And we have another case that we've been involved with in Arizona where a, uh, um, a, a government, a, a state government or federal government employee was out doing surveying in the desert. They found his Jeep. Dad doesn't know where he's at. Young black man. Where did, where did he go? What happened to him? Where's the investigation? I, I, I don't have an answer for you. Yeah. So my understanding is that when this happened in 2018, the only coverage was local. And again, like Dion said, that's shocking only because this is a Hollywood story. So why wouldn't this get huge coverage? Then we had George Floyd. Then we had Black Lives Matter in 2020. And I understand from talking to Rochelle Newman that that's when she was able to get some traction. That's when we got the Variety article out there. We got the Vice article right. and all of that. But it took that kind of event. But the problem is it petered out. And if you look now, there's really no news coverage. It's like every year, it's like, oh, another year's passed. Nothing's happened. Um, but you're right about the standard. Um, you just have to wonder what role race is. And I think there may be another stigma of the mental health thing because that narrative has been pushed. I think people start to say, well, what can we do, you know? If somebody wants to disappear, they're going to disappear and we can't do anything about it. And it's de-emphasizing that there could be foul play. So part, I think part of the responsibility of the media is to put the sheriff's department to task and point out all the deficiencies in an investigation and compare it to a criminal investigation. And you'll find out that it's short. And so whatever sort of inferences you're making are not coming from evidence. Also, Eugene, um, if someone has, you know, maybe some kind of a mental break, you would think that you would try harder to find them, not less. Yes, yeah, right, right. You know, too. Like, right. you see, you see missing, like there's a toddler or a senior or something like that. That hey, we need to find this person now because they might be having a mental break. You don't just stop looking and to justify that you're not looking for them. This is you true. Know, there's another. There's another force potentially at play, and that's the power of Hollywood. So the fact that you know a raw is, you know, maybe they're they're under investigation a little bit here. Um, they've got a lot of power in narrative. 
Uh, the other issue is that it's sort of a little bit of an international thing in that Raw's from UK, Terrence is from UK. I understand from Rochelle Newman that this is not covered at all in the UK. So there's mm -hmm. just a lot of oh, almost like a blackout against. over yes, there. Yes, yes. It really is. Scared. It really seems like that. That's the case that they're purposely not trying to cover it. But I'll tell you, so, and I mentioned this to Rochelle and to Dad and to to Terrence Senior that this stuff weighs on people, and it's it's you your people know what happened, and that guilt is there, and sooner or later somebody's going to say something. The truth has to come out in yep. this. There has to be somebody out there watching this program who knows where he is. So I guess for me, the final thing for us here is how can we continue to raise the consciousness of this case? How could we keep this in the radar so that people are not forgetting this case, so people are remembering this not just once a year. Right. People are right. keeping this at the forefront. Well, I think, like I said, the best we can do is Deanna and I have this action plan to actually do an investigation. Uh, that's going to take funding to do, obviously. And our idea is that we should film this investigation so that if we don't solve it, again, we're getting more eyeballs that's right. on the case and the evidence that we develop. Uh, because we wanna... I, think you're, I think you're right that we should talk about it, of course. But at some point, we're just talking about the same stuff. We need to get in there, get our hands dirty. Um, so I think there's certain things. There's evidence that readily available, like we talked, the, the camera, the laptop. But one of the issues here is a lot of these uh, leads have went dry. They went cold. So if we want to get into, you know, Terrence's social media, into cell phone pings, maybe his cloud backup, well, you need a search warrant. Okay, well, the sheriff's department doesn't want to seem to do that. There may be civil means to do that. So we need to bring a legal expert into this to say, how can we put pressure on to say, I want to subpoena AT&T or whoever the carry is to right. get some of this information? I think part of it is, like we said, putting a team in the field and then chronicling that, you know, and showing. So you, we have regular updates showing, hey, we're here. Here's the site where, you know, that and then maybe, you know. You know, the more the merrier. Maybe more people come in, get eyeballs on it, you know, revisit it. But it's it's going to take putting a team in the field. Absolutely, absolutely. And as I said, definitely, and we we'll, we can talk more about this offline. But definitely, this is something that you know people should be involved in. We definitely want to really keep this in the forefront. Well, I definitely want to have you guys on again to talk more about this investigation as you guys build this stuff up. Um, we want to definitely be involved in any way that we possibly can, that you guys see fit, because there is somebody out there that has to have the answers um, to this case, because this has been something that has really, you know, most of our team on Common Sense are Maryland alums. You know, because we know he graduated from University of Maryland, uh, Philip Maryland College of Journalism. And, like, this has bothered me for quite a long time now. That it seems that, again, there's just more questions than answers. But I hope that we continue to find the answers as much as we possibly can help provide closure, I think, for Terrence's family. And um, we're going to have you guys on again, really, to talk about this and to provide our viewers with updates on the investigation as, as things get going. So Mahul, Ajaria, and Dion Mitchell, hosts of the Crime Redefined podcast. Thank you guys so much. For Great, thank you, Gene. Thank you, Eugene. It was a pleasure. Terrence was not just a freelancer. He was a beloved son, brother, friend, and a colleague to someone he was a human being who deserved the utmost support and assistance before and after his disappearance, regardless of the actual circumstances surrounding it. That was an excerpt from a statement put out on the Find Terrence Woods X account run by Terrence's parents. As far as I'm concerned, the was should become is because I'm confident that Terrence is still with us and someone has to know where he is. We'll have a link to the post where you can read the full statement in the YouTube description below, but I want to go on and read two more portions which read in part, quote, 
Regrettably, Raw TV, Discovery Channel, all three media, journalists, media companies, including Pact.Diversity, the organization Terrence began his career with in the UK, lawyers, police authorities, and colleagues we entrusted to assist us have not provided the help we need. We implore Raw TV, Discovery Channel, and all free media to take responsibility and rectify any missteps in their handling of health, safety, and negligence. We invited Raw, which is owned by all free media who acquired the company from Discovery in 2017, to take part in this edition and answer the lingering questions about the circumstances surrounding Terrence's disappearance. We were issued the following statement stating, quote, Terrence was a popular figure at Raw, he was a well-liked and valued member of the production team, and his disappearance greatly affected us all. We have the deepest sympathy for Terrence's family and friends. It is truly heartbreaking that he has not been found, and we continue to hope that he will be. We also reached out to current Idaho County Sheriff Doug Almer for comments on the status of the case. We haven't heard back. Folks, Terrence has to be found, and the energy has got to be behind that effort. And as Mahula and Dion said earlier on, this will require serious funding and resources. We at Common Sense Entertainment intend to engage and cover the efforts that Mahula and Dion have mentioned in any way they see fit. We will update you on any and all developments in future editions of this program, as well as our Substack page, csemedia.substack.com. In the meantime, I want to urge any of our viewers that wish to assist in this investigation to reach out to both Mahul and Dion on their contact page at crimeredefined.com slash contact. And while you're on that page, I want you to listen to the episodes of their podcasts, including those on Terrence Woods, the links of which we'll have in the description below. It is long past time for Terrence's story and other missing minorities to have the fervent coverage that is so deserved. So I want to put out a call to all media, be it mainstream, independent, or student-run at the University of Maryland or other universities. Reach out to us on our social media pages, which you'll see in the credits. Let's get this story out. Let's find Terrence Woods. After all, Terrence's family deserves answers. They deserve closure. Terrence Woods will not be silenced.